Let's journey back in time into around 6 BC to the city of ancient Jerusalem. King Herod the Great was sitting on the throne of Judea. The center of Jerusalem life was the massive temple built by Herod, who commenced construction in 21 BC. This glorious edifice was not finished until 64 AD under the direction of Agrippa II, just six years before its destruction by the Romans. At the heart of the Jerusalem temple was the daily sacrifice and priestly ministry. Nearly 1,000 years before the birth of Christ, King David erected a tent on Mount Zion in Jerusalem that housed the Ark of the Covenant. This tent is referred to in the Bible as the Tabernacle of David. King David organized the tribe of Levi into 24 divisions in order that priestly ministration, worship, and praise could be offered to God 24 hours per day, seven days a week. Each of these 24 divisions took turns serving in the tabernacle, two non-consecutive weeks per year. This priestly organization was carried over to the Temple of Solomon and down through Hebrew history. The Gospel of Luke brings us to the ministry of one old priest by the name of Zechariah, who was from the tribe of Abijah, the eighth division of the 24. Luke attests to the fact that Zechariah and his wife, Elizabeth, were righteous before God in word and faith. This accolade tells us much about Zechariah. He was a man who honored God in faith, not just the legalistic code of his priestly heritage. He was a man who walked before God in the spirit of the law, not the letter. The fact that Zechariah was a priest in the temple also tells us something. Most of the priesthood was composed of members of the Sadducean party who were aristocratic. In a later episode, we will discuss the differences between the Sadducees and the other Jewish religious groups that impacted the Gospels. We know from Luke's narrative that Elizabeth, the wife of Zechariah, was beyond the years of childbearing, and she had no children. She was barren. To this elderly couple, this barrenness was a social and economic disaster. Without children, parents had no one to support them in their old age. But more so, barrenness was a social stigma seen as a judgment for sin and a defect of the wife. Into this arena, Zechariah stepped forth to perform his duties as a priest in the temple of God. The highest honor of priestly ministration was the burning of incense before the altar of incense. But there were over 18,000 available candidates in the temple at this time. This honor was usually granted only once in a lifetime. Therefore, in order to prevent argument and contention, the honor was selected by the drawing of lots, with the white lot receiving the honor. On this given day, the lot selection fell to old Zechariah. When the time for the burning of incense came, Zechariah moved into the holy place of the temple and stood before the altar of incense with the smoke of the sacred incense filling the temple. Outside, all the assembled worshipers were engaged in prayer, waiting for the return of Zechariah. The most marvelous thing occurred during Zechariah's ministry. In the midst of the sacred smoke, the angel Gabriel appeared at the right side of the altar. Zechariah, who was startled by the elegetic visitation, was gripped with fear. The angel, sensing Zechariah's fear, attempted to calm him before he performed his duty as the messenger of God. Gabriel said, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will give him the name John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, he is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of their fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah, a priest of faith, responded with human reason, not faith. 
he judged his wife and himself to be too old to have children. The angel answered, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent, not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their proper time. Meanwhile, the assembled worshipers outside the temple wondered why Zechariah stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, they saw that Zechariah could not speak by his hand gestures. They knew at this point that Zechariah had seen a vision and a marvelous thing was happening in their presence. Luke said that Zechariah completed his service and returned home to his wife, who shortly became pregnant. Elizabeth remained in seclusion for five months in prayer and worship. It's important to note that John would be consecrated as an ascetic Nazarite dedicated to the mission and purpose of God. Note the parallel between the births of John and Samson. Both mothers were barren and in old age, and both mothers were promised a child who would be empowered from birth for a special task. This child, conceived in the barren womb of Elizabeth, would be filled with the Holy Spirit in his mother's womb and who would call Israel to repentance. Stay tuned. This event is yet to come. It does not take a vivid imagination to hear the Jewish nation for nearly a millennia beseeching God in prayer, send us the Messiah. The prayer ascended to the throne of God as a sweet fragrance of burnt incense. God did not ignore their prayer, but it took nearly 1,000 years for God to prepare the nation of Israel and the world of Rome for the mission and ministry of the Messiah. Gabriel completed his mission to the old priest Zechariah and his aged wife Elizabeth. After six months, the angel Gabriel was sent by God with another message to a small town in Galilee named Nazareth, to a young virgin named Mary, who was approximately 15 years old. This young maiden was betrothed to a Nazarene carpenter by the name of Joseph. The message being carried by Gabriel was the final answer to a millennia of prayer concerning the Messiah. Gabriel carried this historic announcement to Galilee, not to Jerusalem, or Judea, or even to Bethlehem. This is truly amazing. It sure seems that God is not concerned with the opinions of men. Historical records from this time period in Jerusalem history indicate that the inhabitants of Jerusalem looked down upon the Galileans as inferior people because they were only occasionally able to attend services at the temple. There was a Jewish proverb from this time period that said, If a man wants to be rich, go to Galilee. Should he want to be wise, go to Jerusalem. Gabriel saluted Mary with the declaration that she found favor with the Lord. This salutation tells us something about Mary. She must have been a young woman of faith because the Bible teaches that it's impossible to please God without faith. Gabriel delivered the message sent from the throne of God. You will be with child and give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. It's interesting to note that Luke used the Greek translation of the child's name. Jesus is the Greek form of the Hebrew name Joshua that is translated Jehovah saved. Joseph, the betrothed husband of Mary, was also instructed by God in a dream to name the Christ child Jesus. How can this be? Isaiah understood that the Messiah would be born of a virgin and called Emmanuel, not Jesus. Did Isaiah misunderstand God? How can we solve this dilemma? This conflict can be solved by the realization that Jesus would be his physical name, while Emmanuel is a title of honor and respect. Gabriel also informed Mary 
that the child would be the son of the Most High, and her son would inherit the throne of his father David. What kind of covenant with David did the coming of Jesus fulfill? God made a covenant with David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, 12 through 16, that his house, kingdom, and throne would be established forever. How could a mortal man, a descendant of David, inherit an eternal throne? It's apparent that none of the descendants of David, including Solomon, could inherit the eternal covenant given to David. Each of David's descendants played a part in the eternal plan of God, but they were not the inheritor. Gabriel informed Mary that the true inheritor of David's eternal covenant would be her son, Jesus. Only eternal flesh could set on an eternal throne and have an eternal kingdom. As of yet, the world has not seen the manifestation of Jesus Christ as the eternal king. This event will occur during the second advent of Jesus when he is revealed to the earth as the eternal king the inheritor of the covenant of David. We are still living and waiting for the final revelation of the covenant of David, the manifestation of the king priest spoken by the prophet Zechariah. Consider this thought. The name Jesus represents the covenant God made with Abraham, that the Messiah would be the savior of the world, while the name Emmanuel, that is translated, God is with us, represents the covenant God made with David that the Messiah would be Lord of all. Mary turns to the elegetic messenger with confusion on her face. We have a problem. How can this promise be fulfilled since I'm a virgin? The angel Gabriel quietly and simply answered the question. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. How true this statement is. For nothing is impossible with God. To Mary, to all of us through time, nothing is impossible with God. Mary responded to the angel's message with a simple declaration that she was a servant of the Lord, submitted to his will. Let us hear the heart of Mary. Let us respond to the will of God with the heart of a servant. Gabriel left Mary with the realization that her relative, old Elizabeth, who was barren, was six months pregnant. Luke only indicated that after this event, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea to visit Elizabeth. What time frame elapsed between the Annunciation and Mary's visit to Elizabeth? Luke does not make this point clear. How would Anna, the mother of Mary, respond to the announcement that her Mary is pregnant with the coming Messiah? I doubt that she was happy. What kind of trouble and shame will this illegitimate pregnancy bring upon the family? Who is the father? Is Joseph the father? If not, how will Joseph respond? Was Mary sent to her cousin Elizabeth in order to escape family disgrace? How do you think Joseph felt when he heard the confession from Mary, and probably Mary's father, that she was pregnant with the Messiah? The narrative of Matthew's Gospel indicates that Joseph did not believe Mary. He probably thought her story was a wild concoction designed to hide her shame. During these days, a betrothal contract was treated as an actual marriage without sexual intimacy. The union could only be dissolved by a regular divorce procedure. According to the book of Deuteronomy, breach of faithfulness was regarded as adultery and punishable with death. Adultery had always been considered a heinous crime throughout the Arab culture. For example, in Egypt, the adulteress had her nose cut off while in Persia, she had her nose and ears cut off. But the most serious punishment was found in Judea, where adultery was a death sentence by stoning. This form of execution 
is still being used in the Muslim countries of Iran and Iraq. In the case of Mary, the regular punishment would have been death by stoning. Joseph did not want to expose Mary to public shame or infamy due to the fact that he was a just man of mercy and compassion. The law of Moses gave the husband the authority to divorce his wife. The law specifies that a bill of divorce must be issued and the specific causes must be noted. Joseph determined to break his betrothal contract with Mary, but he desired to do so in a quiet fashion without specifying the cause. This action, in itself, is a violation of Deuteronomy marriage law. But Joseph determined that mercy and compassion was more important than adherence to the law of Moses. Joseph did not act hastily, nor did he take the course prescribed by law. I guess we could say that Joseph's action was a sin according to the law, but was it a sin in the eyes of God? The context of Matthew's narrative indicates that Joseph sought God for a proper direction and solution to the problem he had with Mary. God answered his prayer and sent an angel to Joseph in a dream to reveal the truth concerning Mary and her baby. A dream was a common way of making known the will of God to the ancient prophets and the people of God. When Joseph awoke from his sleep, he understood that God spoke to him in a dream it's important to note that Joseph did not react in fear or conjecture with his dream. It's possible that Joseph was accustomed to prophetic dreams. Could he have the gift of prophecy? His controlled actions seem to indicate this possibility. The angel reminded Joseph that he was a legal heir of King David and that the child conceived in the womb of Mary was the Messiah, the true heir of the covenant of David. The angel exhorted Joseph to take Mary as his wife because her wild concoction was true. The child growing in her womb was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. This child, this simple child was the Messiah, and Joseph would have a direct influence upon Israel and the entire world through this child. The angel admonished Joseph to name the child Jesus because this child would save his people from their sins, not from the Romans. Well, this mission creates a problem since rabbinic doctrine for centuries taught that the Messiah would come to save his people from political dominance and foreign occupation. The Jewish nation had the law of Moses and atoning sacrifices to cover their sin. Why would they need a Messiah who would save them from sin. Isn't that the work of the Passover lamb? Maybe God sees deliverance in a different light than we do. A conflict is coming. The true mission of the Messiah is completely different than the mission proclaimed by the scribes, Pharisees, and teachers of the law. Matthew made one simple statement in his gospel that spoke volumes. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and he took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. The journey from Nazareth to the hill country of Judea could have taken anywhere from three to five days, depending on the location of Elizabeth's home. The journey was dangerous due to bandits on the road. Mary's journey was courageous, if not a bit foolhardy, but Mary's unborn babe had an appointment with a babe in the womb of Elizabeth. Often journeys of this nature were conducted in caravans, and therefore we can conclude that Mary probably joined a caravan heading south to Judea. A meeting must take place between two children, a meeting of spiritual importance. Elizabeth's unborn son had a divine appointment with the unborn Messiah. The angel Gabriel informed Zechariah that his promised son would be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. The two babes must come together in order for the Holy Spirit to sanctify the unborn Baptist. Mary entered the home of Elizabeth and greeted her cousin. 
the spark between the unborn babes occurred, and John was baptized in the Holy Spirit. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11 teaches that the mission of Jesus Christ is to baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. Jesus fulfilled his mission even in his mother's womb. Elizabeth, sensing the power of the Holy Spirit, began to sing praise to the Lord. She sang the song of the Lord in a loud voice. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the babe in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. Through the prophetic vision of the Holy Spirit, Elizabeth understood that the babe in Mary's womb is the Messiah, the Lord of all. She also understood how blessed Mary would be because she believed the Lord. The Holy Spirit being released by the unborn Jesus had a dramatic impact on Mary also. The spirit of prophecy came over Mary and she began to flow in prophetic utterance. My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their innermost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but he has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but he has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers. Mary saw the compassion God had for the humble of heart and the great mercy found in his person. Mary also understood how God hated the proud heart of man, how he rejects the arrogant rich, but fills the hungry with good things. Mary also understood that her unborn son would be the blessing to Abraham and her descendants forever. All the nations of the earth would be blessed in fulfillment to the eternal covenant made by God to Abraham. The elegetic visitors that spoke to Mary and Joseph emphasized that the Messiah would come in fulfillment to the covenant of David. Now, Mary sees that her unborn babe will also fulfill the covenant of Abraham. In these two encounters, we see the mission of the Messianic King Priest vividly displayed. The Bible indicates that Mary remained with Elizabeth for an additional three months until the birth of John. In the fullness of time, John is born, and this birth carried special significance because John is a true miracle coming from the womb of a barren old woman. Family, friends, and neighbors gathered for the circumcision ceremony that was officiated by Zechariah, the father of John. The naming of a child at the circumcision ceremony is unique because Hebrew custom required the child be named at birth but Greek and Roman babies were named eight or nine days after birth. The fact that this ritual turned into a naming ceremony only indicates the influence Grecian Roman culture had on Palestinian custom. It's interesting to note that the assembled guests determined that the child should be named after the father, but Elizabeth protested and insisted that the child must be called John. Elizabeth's insistence confused the assembled guests because no relative in her family was named John. In Jewish custom, the responsibility of naming a child belonged to the father, not the mother. The assembled guests looked to Zechariah to confirm the name choice. Remember, Zechariah was struck dumb. He was unable to speak by the angel Gabriel at the altar of incense. Zechariah gestured for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment he wrote, his name is John. 
Immediately, Zechariah was able to speak, and the spirit of prophecy came over him in high praise. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and has redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to rescue us from the hands of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven, to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. Zechariah understood that the Messiah would soon be born, a horn of salvation from the house of David. He also prophesied that the Messiah would come in fulfillment to the covenant of Abraham and would possess the gate of his enemies. To Zechariah and the priesthood, the great enemy of Israel was Rome, but God understood that their greatest enemy was sin. The Messiah would come to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to give to the world the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of sin. Luke completed his narrative with one verse that included nearly 30 years of John's life. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he lived in the desert until he appeared publicly to Israel. This is a strange statement. John living in the desert until the time of his public ministry? All we know is that John went to the desert at some point in his adolescent life. The training of a prophet in the desert is not unusual. God uses the desert as a refiner's fire to purify his prophets for ministry. We see this vividly portrayed in the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. At the time of Jesus, the desert of Judea was a dwelling place for messianic religious groups like the Essenes who dedicated themselves to study and prayer at their desert monasteries. John was born to elderly parents. What would happen to John should they die before John reached maturity? Maybe a relative of John was a member of such a desert community, and John was adopted by a religious group similar to the Essenes. This would not be uncommon, since this religious group was known for their adoption of children at the age of 10 and training them to be disciples. Is it possible that John spent his formative years among the Essenes at Quaram near the Dead Sea, the site of the discovered Dead Sea Scrolls belonging to the Essenes? Examination of the Dead Sea Scrolls clearly indicate that the Essenes were clearly messianic in orientation. By 6 BC, wide-scale censuses were taken every 14 years by Imperial Rome. The information gathered by these censuses were used for evaluating taxes. So it was at the time of the birth of Jesus. Emperor Augustus ordered that a census be taken of the entire Roman Empire. Historical records indicate that this census was conducted according to Jewish custom under the authority of Quinarius, governor of Syria, and the auspices of King Herod the Great. Herod ordered that all families journey to their ancestral homes for census gathering. About 75 miles north of the small rural town of Bethlehem is the bustling community of Nazareth. Setting in the modest home of Mary's parents is Joseph with Mary, his pregnant espoused wife. Consider the dilemma created by this census. Joseph and Mary, and probably a large contingent of relatives, must journey to Bethlehem, the ancestral home of King David, since both families were of the house of David, in order to be taxed. The journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem 
was long and dangerous, especially for a young pregnant woman who was nearing her time of delivery. A direct route to Bethlehem through the hill country of Samaria was physically strenuous and plagued with bandits. The safest route used by the Galilean caravans was to leave Nazareth and travel east to the Jordan River, cross the river and proceed south on the eastern bank of the Jordan. This route was much easier to travel. The caravans would travel south on the eastern bank of the Jordan until they neared Jerusalem, where they crossed back over and completed their journey to the Holy City. Consider the difficulties Mary must have experienced being near the end of her pregnancy, making such an arduous journey. Is it possible that the journey itself brought on the birth of the baby Jesus? Imagine what conditions must have been like when the weary couple reached the town of Bethlehem. The small community would have been thronged with crowds of people completing the census. Each vacant room would have been filled with frustrated taxpayers. Luke recorded the difficulty of this crowded condition in his gospel. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Since there was no room in the inn, somehow Joseph found a cave used as a livestock shelter for Mary to give birth to the Messiah. No doubt a midwife was found who aided Mary in the birthing process, but still the conditions were austere and hard. The newborn child was laid in a manger used to feed livestock. Mary gave birth to the eternal Word of God in rigorous and humble conditions. The Messiah was born in poverty, not kingly prosperity. No royal court gathered around to celebrate the birth of the king priest. Mary wrapped the baby Jesus in swaddling clothes that were long cloth strips used to keep babies' limbs straight so that they could grow properly. The kings of this world enjoy luxury and fine clothes, but the only begotten Son of God came in poverty and humility. What a contrast! Children born to worldly kings enjoy the celebration of royal courts and the citizens of the kingdom, but no royal court gathered around to celebrate the birth of the king priest. Or was there? Luke wanted his readers to understand that the shepherds were tending their flocks of sheep in the fields just outside the town of Bethlehem. Some Bible scholars suggest that these flocks were the temple flocks raised for sacrifice. The religious values found among the temple aristocracy considered shepherds to be of a low class of people because their work prevented them from the religious activities of their community. While these poor shepherds worked their flocks at night, a miraculous thing occurred. The royal court of heaven celebrated the birth of their divine king. A glorious host of angels appeared in the sky and sang a mighty anthem. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born, who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in claws and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men of whom his favor rests. These humble shepherds, who were loathed by the respected religious community, abode in the presence of the heavenly host and heard the first proclamation of the long-awaited Messiah being born. Apparently, God's opinion of these humble men was not the same as the religious community. These shepherds heard the good news that Christ, the Messiah, the Lord of all, was born in the city of David. These humble men left their sheep and found the Lamb of God in the city of David, nestled in the arms of Mary. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, 
glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. The Bible does not present a detailed accounting of the formative years of Jesus Christ, our Messiah. The latter half of Luke chapter 2 and Matthew chapter 2 records only selected events with the bulk of nearly 30 years being silent and obscure. Maybe this was the plan of God, to allow His Messiah to grow and mature without media exposure and publicity. Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, would experience life through the eyes of a simple carpenter's son, a blue-collared worker often seen but ignored. The Messiah would taste family life the way it is. He would not live in an artificial shell, molded by public scrutiny until the time of his public ministry. Luke mentioned that on the eighth day after the birth of Jesus, Mary and Joseph had him circumcised in accordance with Hebrew law. Since no location is mentioned, we can assume that the ceremony occurred in Bethlehem. Luke also made reference to the days of purification. In Jewish law, a mother was required to remain at home for about 40 days after the birth of a male child, and about 80 for a female, and during that time she was reckoned as impure. She was not permitted to go to the temple or to engage in religious services with the congregation. Apparently, Joseph and Mary strive to fulfill the law of Moses properly and piously. In Exodus chapter 13, verse 2, every firstborn male child among the Jews was regarded as holy to the Lord. These firstborn male children were to be set apart to the service of God, to offer sacrifice as a priest and to perform the duties of religion. After completing the 40 days of purification, Joseph and Mary journeyed to Jerusalem in fulfillment to the law of Moses to consecrate their firstborn to the Lord. In accordance with the law of Moses, the young couple offered two turtle doves. While in the temple, an old priest by the name of Simeon observed the sacrifice of Joseph and Mary. Maybe he was the priest who offered consecration sacrifice for Jesus. All that Simeon understood was that he was drawn by the Holy Spirit to the temple. But his encounter with the Christ child would fulfill a divine promise, a divine appointment. Simeon was a son of Hillel, a distinguished teacher in Jerusalem and president of the Sanhedrin, who was a man of age looking for the coming Messiah. We know that he was a just and righteous man before God, and he was devout and pious in his faith. Simeon was a devout Jew who believed in the messianic consolation of Israel, a Jewish term used in that day to describe the mission of the Messiah. The Lord revealed to Simeon, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and glory for your people Israel. Simeon could now die in peace because Jehovah kept his promise and allowed him to see the Messiah. The Holy Spirit revealed to Simeon that the Messiah would come with salvation in his heart and his ministry would bring revelation to the Gentile nations and glory to the nation of Israel. To a Jewish religious community, the idea of the Messiah bringing light and revelation to the Gentiles would be insulting. The common rabbinic teaching insisted that the Messiah would save the nation of Israel from the foreign domination of Gentile nations. Simeon may not have understood what he prophesied, but his declaration is the first indication that the Messianic mission would reach beyond the borders of Israel and touch the nations of the world. The Old Testament prophets understood this simple truth, especially Isaiah, but conquest and blood blinded the eyes of rabbinic thought to the realization that the entire world would partake in the salvation offered by the Messiah. Simeon turned to Joseph and Mary and blessed them. He especially prophesied to Mary, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, 
and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, the sword shall pierce through thine own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Simeon prophesied that the ministry of the Messiah would cause considerable controversy in Israel. Many would fall and rise because of Jesus, and many would outright reject his ministry. Why would the long-awaited Messiah be rejected by the nation of Israel? The answer is obvious. The real manifestation of the Messiah did not occur according to established rabbinic doctrine. Jesus did not fit into the box created by Jewish dogma. Simeon also implies that a sword would pierce the side of this baby Jesus in order that the thoughts of many might be revealed. This event did occur, but a spear was used by a Roman soldier to pierce the side of Jesus. Luke also noted that an old prophetess named Anna, the daughter of Phanel, who was of the tribe of Asher, dwelt in the temple. She served God day and night in fasting and prayer. Her greatest desire was to look upon the redemption of Israel. The tribe of Asher dwelt in the northern part of the land of Canaan. No one knows why Anna was a prophetess, but it's possible she was the wife of a prophet. According to the age given, Anna was 84 years old. Anna also prophesied about the coming redemption of Jerusalem. Mary would also have stored this event in her heart and probably related it to Luke. Luke completes the Messianic birth narrative with the statement that when Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Nazareth in Galilee. There in this loving home, Jesus grew in strength and wisdom because the grace of God was upon him. What is not clear is the actual timeline this event followed. Luke omitted the visit of the Magi and the flight to Egypt. But these omissions do not indicate a denial of events. When we harmonize Luke's narrative with the Gospel of Matthew, we see that Joseph and Mary returned to Bethlehem to probably await their return caravan to Nazareth. Their return was interrupted by two important events in the life of the newly born Messiah. During the first few months from the birth of Christ to the death of King Herod, Jesus lived in Bethlehem. During this period, the Magi came from the east to worship the Christ child. In order to understand the actual physical town of the Messianic birth, the Magi went to Jerusalem and inquired of King Herod's court the location of the Messiah's birthplace. Who were these Magi? Magi were priest sages and students of science, astrology, philosophy, medicine and religion. The Magi were probably from Persia, Arabia, or Babylon. Some Bible scholars believe that these intellectuals of the Medi Persian Empire received knowledge of a great king who would arise in Judea from the Jewish captives who were in exile in Babylon. In fact, the word magician comes from this priestly class of scholars. According to common church tradition, the Magi came to Jesus two years after his birth because the star that announced his birth was visible for two years. This tradition is not sound biblically, since the Magi presented themselves to King Herod, who died in 4 BC. The presence of the star does not necessarily indicate the actual birth of Jesus. To date the birth of Jesus two years prior to the death of King Herod would cause Jesus to be too old for his adult ministry. Recorded in ancient historical records, the appearance of a new star or comet heralded the coming of some extraordinary event. It's the conjecture of some Bible historians that these astrologers from Persia considered the appearance of a new star to be evidence that the long-awaited Messiah was born. These same historians have theorized these astrologers were guided by their belief in the prophecy of Balaam that a star would arise out of Jacob. What did the Magi see? Did they actually see the birth of a new star? There is considerable debate concerning the star of Bethlehem. Some astronomers like the star to a comet, a supernova or a nova. Other scientists have focused on the conjunction of various planets. But in the end, no one knows for sure. Shortly after the visit of the Magi, 
Joseph was warned by an angel in a dream to flee with the Christ child to Egypt because Herod sought to kill the child. Herod became extremely angry when the Magi failed to return and report the location of Jesus. In retaliation for the disobedience of the wise men, Herod killed all the male children less than two years of age in Bethlehem in fulfillment of the prophecy given to Jeremiah. Some historians project that only about 10 children would have been murdered. The small number would be a solid reason for why no historical record exists of this atrocity. According to common tradition, Jesus lived in Egypt for several years, but scriptural dating would put Jesus in Egypt for approximately one to two months. With the death of King Herod, Joseph was instructed to bring the Christ child back to Israel, so fulfilling what the Lord had said through the prophet Hosea, that out of Egypt he would call his son. Since Archuletus reigned in Judea, Joseph returned to the Galilean city of Nazareth, completing the narrative of Luke. During the growing years of Christ, little is mentioned but only that the Christ child grew strong in body, mind, and spirit. Luke referenced only one event during the adolescence and early adult years of Jesus. According to the Law of Moses, an annual pilgrimage to Jerusalem was required at Passover, and we see this event occurring with Jesus at the age of 12. Even though this is a debatable issue, it is believed that this event was the bar mitzvah of Jesus when he was presented to the rabbis as a son of the law and came under the obligation of observing the law personally. This event is significant because we see the great wisdom of the Messiah come out in his discourse with the Jerusalem rabbis. The very fact that Jesus believed that the holy temple of Jerusalem was the house of his father is a clear indication that Jesus, at this young age, understood his relationship to God and his messianic mission. The Old Testament closes with a prophecy from Malachi that God would send Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. We see this event in the miraculous birth of John the Baptist, who was a cousin of Jesus Christ. We also see a virgin give birth to the Messiah, who would change the course of human history. The New Testament hinges on the fact that Jesus was the virgin-born Son of God. Into this world of Roman chaos and royal intrigue, two young babes were born, two children who would heed the call of God and open the doors of salvation to all human flesh that hungers for God. This Jesus, the Messiah, would bring glory to his people Israel and would bring eternal light to the darkened world of the Gentiles.